I'm a biologist, not a structural engineer, which is probably definitely a minority in this room today. Uh, in, and I have to admit, even working for Arab, I am always extremely intimidated by rooms like this, because I just have a natural assumption that all engineers are smarter than me. Um, so hopefully um, I'll have something interesting to tell you. And the key thing, of course, uh, being a biologist, is that I'm really interested in systems and how things um, evolve over time. So this talk is not really about structural engineering specifically, and specifically about your profession. It's much more about how your overall context and the system that you operate in might change over time. So it's about the bigger picture, if you like, and then hopefully there'll be some things that you can translate down to what it actually means to you, and also set the scene for some of the exercises that we'll be doing in the morning and throughout the afternoon. Um, so just to summarize again, in the morning, we will really be thinking about the broader picture for the future of the profession. So it's not specifically for the institution yet, it is really about the profession and the bigger picture and context around that. And in the afternoon, that's when we're going to focus much more on the role of the institution in response to some more specific themes and questions that we collectively think are important for our shared future. So that's broadly the structure of the day. So, as Faith mentioned, I lead the Foresight team at Arup, and what we do is basically think about change. And we do this because we recognize that change is constant. The world around us is always evolving and is always transforming, and we as individuals and organizations have to try to understand that change so we can adapt and thrive in the long term. So change is constant. This is Shanghai in the 90s, and it's you know, a really classic picture that for me just highlights how quickly the built environment is changing around us. As I said, this is a scene in the 90s, and this is roughly what it looked like eight years ago. I haven't got a more up-to-date picture. I need to change that because, of course, there's a range of tall buildings which have again been added to that skyline. But for me, it just shows the massive scale and speed of transformation that is happening all around us. And maybe it's a little bit slower in the Western world and places like London, compared to Asia and other places, but it is certainly happening everywhere around us. This was a cover of Forbes magazine almost exactly 10 years ago. So I think it says the 12th of November 2007. And it's got the CEO of Nokia at the time, and it says, one billion customers, can anyone catch the cell phone king? And of course, the world has changed massively since then. And 10 years, in my view, isn't such a long time, but Nokia is almost irrelevant when it comes to mobile phones, and new companies such as Apple, Samsung, Google, and others have really taken over that market in a totally different way. So we have to also think about what does transformation mean for businesses? What does transformation mean for skills, for professions, and so forth? So we can avoid the faith of thinking that everything is fine and make use of the opportunities that we're facing in this changing world, because we do not want to be the blockbuster of our professions. You know, we want to be the Netflix that continues to adapt, that figures out new ways to reach customers, that figures out new ways to deliver services, and therefore is the one that thrives. I mean, I find this absolutely uh, staggering how a company can be having six billion in revenue until about 2008, and then almost drop off the face of the planet in just two years because the market environment changes so quickly and because the company simply wasn't able to adapt. Often it is that people see the change coming, but they're certainly sometimes not able to act on it because of existing structures or existing vested interests in the status quo. So change can also be highly disruptive. Um, so change is constant. If we start looking at the trends that are shaping our shared future, we actually start to realize that most organizations, <laughs> most professions, most skills are impacted by the same sets of trends and drivers. If you're a vehicle manufacturer or Coca-Cola or an engineering business, you all know that climate change and the aging population and the technology revolution will shape your future. What is always different is the context, the way it shapes you. So change is constant, but context is variable. How trends will impact a specific organization is always context dependent. And that's again what we're trying to do this morning where we will give you some trends later to look at, some of which I'm gonna cover in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then it will be up to you to contextualize them and start thinking about what they mean for you personally and for the broader profession. 
Um, and the question, of course, that we want to look at is what does our future look like? And usually we can approach that question from two different directions. It's always about trying to understand that future context which we're moving into. And we can either look at the big trends, the mega trends, and say, translate downwards what they mean for us. Or we can look at so-called weak signals, emerging case studies, things that we see around us which might give us clues about how our world might look different in the future. And that's based on the saying by William Gibson is that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So we're looking at what's happening in other parts of the world, maybe also other professions. We can get clues on how our world might look different in years to come. So why does this particularly matter to us? Well, as engineers and designers, the projects that we do can sometimes take decades to come to completion. Sometimes it's quicker, but they can take decades. So we are making decisions about how something will function, will work, will operate, will look like many years in advance of it actually being used. And it means that we have to ask ourselves the question again, what will be the future context for that reality that we're designing for? What will be the demographics and lifestyles? What might be new user needs and expectations that we have to consider? What might be the environmental conditions? And the three questions that we have to ask ourselves are what would we like to know about the future? What should we know about the future? And what do we absolutely have to know about the future to make the right decisions today? And that's essentially, again, what some of these exercises are about. So the future is also about getting a better understanding of the present. Many things that we look at when it comes to future thinking are about complexity and are about interactions in a more complex system. So as we kind of expand that cone of possibility towards the future, we're trying to understand how the system evolves and we're trying to understand for ourselves what is the possible future, the space that we're moving into, and what is the more probable future, the thing that is most likely, and for us, most importantly, what is actually the preferable future that we want to head into so that we can start to also influence those probabilities and move into the direction that we feel is most desirable for us. So it's about probability, it's about preferability, and it's about you know, the possible space that we're operating within. The one thing that we always try to stress when it comes to future thinking is that we think about the future holistically. Again, in a group of engineers, you might think that there could be a focus on the technical aspects of the future. But if you think about what we do, really sometimes the social things or the economic things or even the political context can be much more influential in shaping what the future looks like. So we try to always use the so-called STEEP framework to force us to think holistically about something. And STEEP simply just stands for the letters of these, the first letters of these words, there, the social, the technological, the economic, the environmental, and the political. And again, when we present you with the translator for the exercise, you will know that there will be aspects from all of these. And I ask you not to discard something just from the title or something that you're unfamiliar with, but really to think about it and to analyze, well, actually, could this be important for us? And how could it be important to you? I'm now going to just talk about a few trends and issues and changes in the world that I personally find uh, particularly interesting. And again, they are not specific to the profession, but hopefully there'll be some clues about how that changing context could impact you. And the first topic is about new urban realities and how our cities are changing and the overall urbanization of the world. The first thing that we know is that in many parts of the world, of course, cities are growing at an absolutely phenomenal pace. So this is the population growth of the world's top 15 megacities in millions um, from 2011 to 2025, the projections from the UN Population Division. And you can see that some cities like Tokyo are actually growing relatively slowly, only 5% growth. But other cities like Beijing, 44% growth. What does that mean for infrastructure, buildings, services that are required for those massively and rapidly growing populations in those urban centers. We also know that overall the world population is going to grow to about 8 billion by 2025. And interestingly, we often talk about the urbanization of the world. But in reality, the rural population is also staying stable and actually increasing a tiny bit as well, which is this statistic here 
uh, on the left. The other thing that we can see for this is that uh, the urban growth that is actually happening is disproportionately focused on cities that are maybe smaller than 500,000 inhabitants or within the range of 500,000 to a million. And if you think about the dialogue around urbanization, most of the dialogue is not focused on those cities at all. It is focused on the mega cities, you know, the well-known cities like Sydney and Tokyo and Beijing and Berlin and so forth. Well, Berlin is probably actually nearly in the million category. But anyway, so I think for us as professionals, we also have to think if that's the area where most of the growth will happen over the coming decades, are we paying enough attention to those type of cities? Question mark. The other thing that is happening apart from growth is, of course, aging of the population. Um, last year, in 2017, we were probably, and this is you know, an estimate, at a really interesting inflection point uh, in time, where for the first time there were more people aged 65 plus than there were kids in the world uh, up to the age of five. So there's a rapid shift now in the overall proportion of people in the world, and that population growth and aging has a really, really interesting impact also on cities and the built environment. This is one statistic for Tokyo in particular, and I grant you that Japan and Tokyo is a very specific case, but it shows some of the challenges that cities are facing when it comes to aging in particular. So here's Tokyo, where in the middle, roughly, we got 2020, and it's the overall size of the population. And uh, the blue bit at the bottom are, um, are, are kids and teenagers um, under 15 years old. The gray bit is essentially the working age population from 15 to 65. And the pink bit is over 65. And you can see that the population of the city overall is shrinking over time. At the same time, it's massively aging. So how do you, as a city government, deal with the fact that your workforce is shrinking, your population is shrinking, but the people who are in the class category of 65 plus are massively expanding. Again, what does that mean for services? What does that mean for the transformation of the urban environment? It's a really, really interesting challenge to think about. And um, we started to look at this um, for um, a project that we did with a client in Hong Kong, um, a, a mass transit operator. And uh, one of the questions that they has, had based on this, well, okay, if this is really the case, and if this is also impacting us, the aging population, what does that mean for how we deal with our assets, with our services, and so forth? And just to illustrate you a very simplified pathway of thinking from this trend to action, you first of all have the trend, which is the aging population, the what. You then have the implications. There's something around station accessibility. Hong Kong, if you will know, is a very dense urban environment. Very few lifts and escalators lots of stairs when you access the trains. So what does that mean, you know, if people have more issue actually getting into the station in the future? There's something around station operation. Again, the stations are very crowded, they're very fast-paced, people move very fast. Do we need more people to guide people around, to help them in and out of the carriages and so forth? And then, of course, all of that has implications for station upgrades. How do you change those stations over time? And for this organization, the action that was then taken in response to that was a new station design guide so that when architects and engineers came in to upgrade a station or to build a new station, they would have information that would help them to make smarter choices about how to design for an older cohort of travelers in the future. And also an investment strategy to say, well, we know how different parts of the the population will age in Hong Kong over the coming decades. Maybe we need to invest in lift capacity here first and then here because, of course, as an organization, if one, one new lift costs a million Hong Kong dollars or whatever, you have to make choices about where to do that first. So that's a very simple illustration of how you can go from the contextual changes, the trend, to something very specific on how an organization might react to that shift in their operating environment. The next topic, which I think is particularly relevant to you, is this focus on city resilience and the challenge of cities to respond to an ever-increasing and diverse uh, array of shocks and stresses that they might be facing. Now, these could be natural stresses, such as earthquakes or wildfires, or they could be man-made stresses, such as terrorism or population growth or shortages of water or whatever. What we know um, when it comes to risks is that one of the key risks facing cities is, of course, the failure of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Now, this is the global risk landscape from the World Economic Forum. 
uh, from 2016. I just looked at the new one for 2018 yesterday, didn't manage to quite put it into the new slide pack, but it's almost the same picture. In terms of impact, the top 10 risks, number one is uh, failure of climate change, mitigation, adaptation. In terms of likelihood, number two is extreme weather events, and number three is again failure of climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. So this is a big issue for cities going forward, and many are struggling with it. Another thing related to this is, of course, global sea level rise. There's various estimates for this, and usually they get, get um, changed upwards at the moment as we recognize that actually the sea levels are changing much faster than expected. But it's certainly a reality that we will be increasingly faced with. I found it really interesting to follow the dialogue around the water shortages in Cape Town at the moment because you start to see tweets and kind of messages from people that almost feel like they could be coming from a different world, you know, where someone describes how the rain started to fall in, in Cape Town and everyone started to run out of the restaurant to experience rain for the first time. And these kind of things, you know, the fact that a major city could run out of water just wasn't part of our dialogue just a few years ago. And suddenly it's becoming a real reality, a real possibility for many, many parts of our planet. Um, this is a diagram that shows cities most threatened by rising sea levels. Um, the darker red, which hopefully, hopefully you can see, is that outer ring would be for 4 degree warming, and the inner ring, the lighter red, is for 2 degree warming. Uh, in a city like Shanghai, again, 40% at 2 degree warming, percentage of population affected based on a 2010 baseline, and 76, so almost 80% in a 4 degree warming scenario. So these are really, really serious risks that cities are facing. And as engineers and structural engineers, how do we provide the environment that can cope with that and that can adapt to that and that can change over time in response to this risk and mitigate it much better? We also now have a range of tools available. This is a tool that uh, Arab uses called WeatherShift, where you can start to use IPCC data to um, project what the average temperature would be like in a city or even in a district within a city in coming decades based on current climate change projections. So we have the data and the question is really how can we utilize this data to design for a new normal? To already think about today to say, okay, we know the world will be different in 20 or 30 years times. How can we make the right decisions today to make sure that the buildings and structures and infrastructures are ready to adapt for this context? Because many cities and many places are really struggling with this at the moment. Um, one of the solutions, of course, um, which I'm very keen on promoting is the use of green infrastructure. So in China, there's this really nice initiative um, by the government called the Sponge City. And I like this idea of the city being a sponge that can suck up the water when it rains, when there's heavy surface water flooding or whatever, and then slowly release it over time. This is an example of that kind of strategy, the Quinlin Stormwater Park in Harbin, which is in northeastern China. One of the big challenges with that is that it's much harder to invest in things like that. If you're building a bridge, if you're building a road, if you're building a building, it usually has a pretty solid business case attached with it. It's pretty clear what your rate of return will be or how the funding might be coming to place. If you're building a park or if you're greening a city, it's much harder. So cities have to figure out new ways to fund these things through public-private partnerships or other ways because uh, there isn't clear funding mechanisms for them um, at the moment, and it's one of the biggest challenges that we have to solve to make our cities more resilient over time. Another way, of course, is to think about infrastructure and spaces in a much more multi-use and adaptable way. So this is a, a, a nice little example of um, a stormwater and urban leisure park in Rotterdam. So you can see in normal conditions, it's just used as a playground for sports and for other recreational activities. And when it rains, it transforms into a water-holding feature that can make sure that the urban system isn't overloaded with surface water flooding in those kind of situations. So thinking about the city and the infrastructures that we create as adaptable things that can deal with these risks in very different ways to that we've been used to in the past, I think is a really important consideration for us going forward. <clears throat> and the question, of course, is what does the future prove <clears throat> excuse me, city of the future actually look like? You know, is it through green infrastructure? Is it through smarter solutions? Is it through better resource use? Uh, we don't have the answers, but we certainly need to start asking the right questions. Um, the next topic I just want to touch on quickly is the idea of data-driven infrastructure, or probably a better word would be insight-driven infrastructure. 
Um, now, this is a little satellite. It's about the size of a shoebox. It's by a startup in California called Planet Labs. And they have already shot about 180, I think, of them roughly into space. And the idea is that they are creating a mesh around the planet and that they can collectively take a fresh image of the planet every day. And that is a bit of a revolution because the price point at which they are offering this is much, 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 much lower than the traditional satellite operators have been able to provide in the past. The image quality also isn't as good, but it's a much lower price point. And by suddenly being able to have a fresh image of the planet every day, you can also start to track and monitor changes over time. So previously, for example, if you go onto Google Earth, some of the images of your backyard might be three, four, five years old because it costs a lot of money to actually purchase these images at the moment. If we move towards a world where you could have a fresh image of your backyard every day, you could track you know, your environment in very, very different ways. One example of how this is already happening, these are images using Planet Lab satellites uh, of oil storage facilities in China. And the idea is that um, by looking at these storage facilities and by knowing where the sun is at the time of the image being taken, you can start to calculate the depth of the shadow and actually estimate the actual storage capacity in the country to a much higher accuracy than the official statistics that you might get from the government or other sources on a regular basis. And of course, as a financial trader, you can then start to make really interesting decisions about how the oil, tri oil price might change or how the availability of oil might change over time. So it's really interesting how this is suddenly becoming an enabler for a very, very different understanding of how the surface of our planet actually works and also insights for the surface of our planet. And of course, this is a very specific example, but the question for you would be, you know, as structural engineers, if you would be able to have access to a CCTV like that of the entire planet, how might you use it? How might the data be used? Where could it be useful? Could it be useful for understanding better how cities are actually being used, how assets like bridges are actually being used, how many cars are in a place at a certain time, and so forth. So lots of questions that come as these opportunities emerge. So that's at the macro scale, if you like, the scale of the planet. Um, at the city scale, again, um, because a lot of what we do is now mobile phone driven and app driven, of course, we're collecting lots and lots of data about how app people actually use the city. This is an image here from a, a, a mobility service called Beeline in Singapore, where you simply say, you know, you need a lift and then a kind of shared bus uh, comes and picks you up as and when demand emerges in your neighborhood. So it's kind of a, a self-regulating system where the routes are determined by demand. And that is, of course, interesting um, in itself. But more interesting is the data that then emerges in terms of where people are actually asking for that service. Because the red highlights there that you can see on the diagram then show where there's particularly high demand in the city for, for Beeline. And at the same time, it probably tells you that those are also the areas where there's a lack of investment in public transport infrastructure or there's simply a lack of availability. So the city government, you suddenly understand much better where the actual demand opportunity might be for investing in future infrastructure requirements. So using data in interesting ways to make more insight-driven decisions about how to invest in things and how to transform things is really interesting. And again, it's a mobility example, but you can imagine you know, various applications, again, also for how we monitor maybe the function of a building or the function of a piece of infrastructure to make use of that data much better. And you probably have examples of that that I'm not aware of, um, but it's certainly interesting to think about it. The same is happening in London right now. This is the city, city mapper bus, bus here in London. So loads of people use the city mapper app in London, which is just a, a kind of app to show you how to get from A to B. So you type in where you are and you type in where you want to go and it gives you various route options. And you then make that choice based on price, convenience. You can actually also make it in terms of calorie count. So if you're on a weight loss mission, you can choose the mode that gets you there using, the most, uh, using up the most calories. And City Mapper has then collected this data over years and years and years and has figured out then that actually, well, there's a route through central London that currently isn't well served by, or not as efficiently served by public transport, and we're going to provide a, a bus that covers that route because we know exactly that our people want to get from A to B uh, along that stretch. So that's something that's happening again right now, which is an insight-driven decision an insight-driven provision of public infrastructure 
very different to how we used to provide public transport infrastructure in the past, where it was much more based on estimates and, and, and route availability and so forth. Um, the next thing that's happening, of course, is this idea of artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're now rapidly moving into a world where machines are gaining very different capabilities. Um, you know, machine vision and image recognition has already surpassed the capability of humans. The same for hearing and language. Computers can actually now hear language better than humans with less errors. And the same also for thinking. Through machine learning, machines are for the first time in limited amounts able to make their own decisions and create their own things and think almost for themselves. And it's, it's a very narrow application. So for example, um, I don't know if you use Google Translate, but Google Translate um, last year switched from an algorithm-based system where the computer was exactly told how to make you know, changes between words and so forth to a machine learning driven system and the machine actually figured out its own way to translate from one language to another in a way where not even the Google engineers now understand how it works but it works much more effectively and it's much more efficiently. And it's kind of scary but it also shows the potential of it. Um, now of course um, all of these things are not without risk and one of my favorite examples of you know using data in an interesting way is uh, this example in Amsterdam, where uh, Amsterdam did this thing called Apps for Amsterdam. And basically they said, well, we'd like the community of entrepreneurs and techies and hackers to come up with a few useful apps um, for the community of Amsterdam and tourists and so forth um, that would help make our city better. So what they did is they provided that group of people with a whole range of data about the city and just said, here you go, here's the data, play with it. Um, and it led to some really, really interesting ideas. And again, it shows the kind of risk factor attached to this. The number one app was um, how to find a public toilet, which I find you know, is a useful application. The number two app was actually a tool that you could use uh, to figure out which were the best houses to burgle. <laughs> so it used data in terms of uh, availability of street lighting, uh, distance from a police station, and average income level. And then essentially told you, okay, you know, these are the places that you have the highest chance of running away with something useful uh, on a dark night. So these things can be extremely powerful and empowering when we use them in the right way, but they also carry huge risks uh, in terms of, um, you know, how they could actually shape, um, you know, how the world works. Um, so I think the final topic is the idea of new design paradigms for buildings. And again, you probably know a lot more than I about this, um, but the few topics that we find interesting, one of them is health and well-being. I think one of the things that's changed a little bit over the past maybe three, four, five years is that we're starting to get a much deeper and you could argue scientific understanding of how spaces and buildings and interiors actually impact and influence people. There's now better data on you know, the role of light and acoustics and so forth, on, uh, on productivity, on health and well-being and so forth. And we're moving a little bit away from guessing that these things are important to, again, having actual data on it. And as a consequence, there is now a changing dialogue about how buildings should influence people in a different way. And one example of this, and I, I don't want to kind of, um, you know, promote this in any other way, but it's one example is the well-building standard, which starts to take um, a different approach to certifying buildings. We're, of course, very used to certifying buildings by LEED and BREEAM and other sources which are uh, predominantly sustainability-focused. Um, um, well is one of the first standards which is looking much more at how buildings actually impact people and how we can create spaces that enhance human health and well-being. And we just got well certifies in our Cork office in, in Ireland, which is, which is what that image is. Um, and the reason we think there is a business case behind this, because if you look at the kind of um, operating cost of, of a standard business, and this is, you know, huge averages, but usually it's one, you know, 0.1% is energy cost, 0.9% is rental cost, and 1% uh, is energy, 9% rental cost, and 90% is staff cost. So why are we not paying more attention to people? Because really they are the highest cost when it comes to operating a business. And again, so that's the, the shift in focus when it comes to building, paying more attention to people. Not saying that sustainability doesn't matter, but adding this as another layer for us to think about. 
And just to look at, you know, for a few seconds what this covers, it's about the quality of the air, the quality of the water, the quality of the food being served, natural light availability, things that encourage fitness. So, for example, making sure that stairs are more prominent than lifts, which is something that I think is changing in a lot of commercial developments that we are looking at suddenly. You know, the, the, the stairs used to be kind of hidden behind the lifts in the corner and they were difficult to find. Now they're coming to the forefront to encourage people to take these as they move up and down the building and the lifts are kind of being pushed to the back. Of course, that's also a reflection of people using buildings differently and traveling in them more frequently during the day. Uh, then there's something around comfort and, of course, also mental health and well-being. It's a huge issue in the workplace. Loads of people in the UK, for example, suffer from stress and anxiety at work. So what can we do to create an environment um, that reduces some of those negative factors and therefore positively impacts um, also productivity in our wider economy? Um, <clears throat> another aspect related to the management of buildings and structures is, of course, the tactical use of data for their operation. The building that is always mentioned at the moment as, as one of the case studies is the, the Edge in, in Amsterdam. Uh, it's the Deloitte headquarters. It was by a developer called um, OVG. Uh, they work together with Philips and other tech manufacturers. Um, it's not a perfect building. I've heard plenty of negative things about it as well, but it's certainly very technology enabled. It's got 22,000 sensors throughout the building and it really collects everything from occupancy which is on the scale of more useful, to coffee usage, which is probably on the scale of less useful, although even for coffee usage, uh, they figured out that they had to increase the size of the milk containers because cappuccino consumption was much higher than expected. <laughs> so that's one example. But when it comes to utilization, it's actually really interesting and it's actually really useful because if you can start to understand how your building is really being used, rather than walking around with a, you know, a little board and marking up how occupied a space is, if you can really understand that, well, the building is less occupied on a Thursday, so maybe we can switch over floor, or actually meeting rooms for four people are much more popular than meeting rooms for eight people, so with the next refresh, let's make a few more of these. You start to, again, make design decisions and operational decisions that are driven by inside and not on intuition. And I think this is really the game changer for a lot of our industry is that suddenly we have data available and insight connected to data available that should help us make very, very different decisions. And the question is how can we work with these machines and these data sets in a collaborative way to really change the way that we design and design better, more efficiently, and in response to all of the complexities and challenges uh, that I mentioned earlier. So finally, something about people, changing mindsets and expectations. I think it's also important to think about how we are changing, how the generations are changing, how the new engineers and professionals that are coming into this world are different. Um, one of the things, of course, that's changing overall is our working environment, the way we work, the way we interact with each other. You know, we are all probably going from a world where we've got uniform working hours, clearly defined tasks, dedicated spaces, a pretty clear work-life separation and you know, playing with pens and paper and other kind of analog tools to a world where it's super flexible, it's really individual, how you work, with whom you work and what you do. Um, a lot of it is remote and mobile, so you know, I can do most of my job on my mobile phone probably if I had to. Um, much more work-life integration, so we all know this, work has moved into our lives, into our homes, and at the same time life should also be able to move into work because there has to be a balance. You know, it has to swing both ways, in my view at least. So what does that mean for how we work, how our offices are operated, how we engage with people and our colleagues? And most of that is driven by digital ecosystems, so platforms and tools and machines that help us manage all of this flexibility and individualization and so forth. So that's, again, the broader context. Um, for us, we also know there's going to be a skill shortage, probably, globally, in our sector. Um, we know that um, supply and demand will be mismatched, in particular when it comes to tertiary education. Um, by 2020, there might be as much of, as a 10% skill, skill gap. And at the same time, I think another thing that I find interesting is, yes, we'll have a skill gap, but we're also moving into a world now where many organizations from many different sectors are actually competing for the same talent. In a way, maybe that hasn't been the case in the past. So for example, if you think about data and digital and machine learning and artificial intelligence, 
almost every company is trying to build a capability in that at the moment. And there was an article yesterday in Bloomberg Business Week that I read, which estimated that when it comes to real AI and machine learning expert, it's probably between 50 to 200,000 people worldwide that can actually do that at the moment. So when it then comes to those specialist skills within those skills that we think will transform all of our organizations, there might be a real competition for talent and at the same time an overall skills gap. And you can just see how that works you know, within the tech sector at the moment where talent is moving from Yahoo to Microsoft all to Facebook and back to Google and all the best people and they're all fighting for people and they're trying to provide the best workplace perks and, and, um, and these are the kind of organizations that we might be competing with in the future when it comes to the talent that we need in the engineering sector. And for me, that's a really interesting question. What does it mean about how we organize our workspaces, how we attract people? You know, why should someone from Facebook join Arab, for example? It's a, it's a big question, and it's a big challenge for us to think about that because we want to have those type of people in our firms and our businesses and in our professions as well because it is what is required um, to manage a lot of these transformations. Another thing is, of course, uh, generational changes. Um, where we're now moving into a world where these digital natives are emerging. You know, my kids have never known a screen they can't touch and manipulate with their hands. You know, I didn't even have a phone until I was probably, a mobile phone until I was probably 22 or something like that. So it's a, it's a very different world they're growing up in, in and they're interacting in different ways, they're meeting people in different ways, they're accessing information in different ways. And it's important to think about what that means and how we deal with that. Because if we look at, for example, the baby boomers versus the Generation Y, just as an example of how they um, deal with work and deal with workplace issues, um, you know, for the baby boomers, work is an exciting adventure, career, work and then retire. For the millennials, it's about a means to an end, fulfillment, flexible work engagements. The baby boomers are looking for making contribution, fitting in with the company vision, team approach, job security and loyalty. And maybe the millennials are looking much more for network, less hierarchical, relaxed and formal, and so forth. You know, continue learning through peers, and, and they want to be challenged. So there's different expectations. And we, again, as a profession and as an institution, need to recognize that those expectations are changing so we create the communities and the environment that also the emerging engineers and the people with new skills and talents that we want to attract to our community, to our world, actually attracted to that and want to be part of it. And um, one of the, just to finish, one of the spaces I think that for me in many ways represents what the future of engineering and creation and making and innovation could be like is Autodesk's Pier 9 space in, in San Francisco. It's a kind of workspace that has all of the latest machinery for making, so CNC mills and laser cutters and a wood workshop, electronics workshop and so forth, um, 20 of the latest 3D printers. And it's a place where artists and engineers and others meet to just innovate and try things out and make stuff. And it's a wonderful environment. Um, as I said, you know, this is what the workplace looks like. This is what the, the, um, the machine floor looks like. Um, and here's someone interacting with a robot. So in many ways, you know, maybe these are the type of environments, the type of context that we have to create to make sure that our industry continues to thrive in this changing world and that we also make sure that we find ways to, um, to solve the grand challenges that I mentioned um, at the beginning of, of the talk. Um, I want to finish with um, this quote by Elon Musk, which... Um, he mentioned at TED17, Elon is, of course, um, you know, a bit of a divisive character. Some people really love him as a visionary. Other people you know, think he's, you know, he's maybe overplaying a lot of the things, in particular when it comes to some of his engineering visions. Um, but um, he said at TED, I look at the future from a standpoint of probabilities. It's like a branching stream of probabilities. So think back to the cone I showed at the beginning. And there are actions that we can take that affect those probabilities or that accelerate one thing or slow down another. So if you think and go through today, you know, what are the actions that you as an institution, as individuals, as professionals, as structural engineers can take to influence probabilities in a positive way, to move to a world that we actually want to live in and should live in rather than have to live in? And I think that's it. Thank you.